tonight, dominating the pitch. The U.S. women take home their fourth World Cup, but the fans want another victory. Equal pay! Equal pay! What would it take to get equal pay for equal play? It's the job of ambassadors to give frank, personal opinions. Clumsy and inept, the not-so-diplomatic description of the U.S. president. How the world found out what the British ambassador really thinks of Donald Trump. This one here is really gone. Fire in northern Ontario forces hundreds to flee. We hear from someone who chose to stay. This is The National. We begin tonight with the world's most popular sport and how it's changing. Today, the FIFA Women's World Cup final was cause for wild celebrations, not just for the winning U.S. team, but for the movement that demands equality in sports. <laughs> Fans across the U.S. were whipped into a frenzy as their team shut out the Netherlands 2-0. This is what victory looked like in the locker room today, capping off a knockout series. During seven games, only three goals were ever scored against these champs. And a lot of people just could not get enough. Là, ça y est. Pour ce sport féminin, les choses ne seront plus jamais pareilles. Finally, for this women's sport, things will never be the same again, said the French president Emmanuel Macron, pointing to the records broken for TV ratings in France, Germany, the US, and China. When France met Brazil in the semifinals, it was the most watched game of women's soccer ever, with more than 45 million viewers in just those two countries. There has never been so much money in women's soccer, but will it trickle down to the athletes who've been tearing up the field to make it all happen. Katie Nicholson looks at what needs to be done to close FIFA's gender gap. Where normally you'd hear chants of USA. Equal pay! Equal pay! Equal Another, more urgent message echoes through the stadium in Lyon. Quick, 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 quick. An ocean away in Toronto, the calls for equal pay help drive young girls with big dreams through this grueling workout. I hate it when people are like sexist, especially like about sports. So I'm really happy to hear that. It makes me feel good about how the world is changing. Even in the world of sports merchandise. Earlier this week, Nike reported that the women's U.S. soccer jersey is now the number one soccer jersey, men's or women's, ever sold on Nike.com in one season. Ellen Hislop writes about sports for The Gist, a women's sports newsletter she helped create. It's always been a question mark of whether or not women can make the money in the same way that the men can. So the fact that the American women's team is the number one selling jersey on Nike.com is amazing. And yet, even though this U.S. women's team won its fourth World Cup today, its players are paid just 38 cents on the dollar when compared to the U.S. men's team. Hoping to even the score, it launched this lawsuit against the U.S. Soccer Federation on International Women's Day. Both sides are heading into mediation. And then there's World Cup prize money. FIFA set aside 30 million in prize money for this Women's World Cup, but the pot for the Men's World Cup last year, that was more than $400 million. All of this as viewership of women's games, a major source of revenue, is also on the rise. In the UK, the England-US semi-final was the most watched TV event of the year. Hislop says fair pay is key to keeping girls in the game. Hopefully we get to a place where a girl isn't 14 or even 18 year old and says, oh, I don't know what's next for me in soccer because they can't get paid. It's what's next for me is I'm going to go pro so because I can support myself. At 12, Beatrice Medline knows she wants to go pro and she knows what she wants to be paid. Definitely, same as the guys, hopefully more, uh, but <laughs> at least the same as the men um, because I want to be their equal or better. For this team of young hopefuls, there's still a few years to get it right. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Some harsh words for Donald Trump today from the British ambassador calling the Trump administration inept. The president himself uniquely dysfunctional. 
So if that seems like undiplomatic language for a diplomat, that is because it's from a trove of secret cables leaked to the press. And as Renee Filipponi explains, they tell a story about what London's top man in Washington really thinks. The cables reveal the anxiety at 10 Downing early in Trump's presidency as Trump lambasted allies, bombed Syria and backed out of international treaties. We don't want other leaders and other countries laughing at us anymore, and they won't be. Sir Kim Derrick wasn't reassuring. We don't really believe this administration is going to become substantially more normal, less dysfunctional, less unpredictable, less faction-riven, less diplomatically clumsy and inept. The trick, according to Derrick, was to stroke Trump's ego. You need to start praising him for something that he's done recently, adding you need to make your point simple, even blunt. Derek clearly believed he could score points with pomp. His cables revealed immense efforts to dazzle Trump and his entourage during their visit to the UK last month, which apparently paid off. Although initially worried about getting the protocol right, by the end he could not have been happier or more fulsome in his assessment. But he also warned the boost for Britain wouldn't last. This is still the land of America first. Diplomacy now from both capitals is focused on playing down the significance of the leaks. It's the job of ambassadors to give frank personal opinions about what's happening in the countries they serve. And those are just that, personal opinions. I don't think it will affect the special relationship. Uh, it, it's an irritant, no doubt. But all of Derek's work on Trump is likely ashes now. Trump's response today. We're not, we're not big fans of that man. And he has not served the UK well. So I can understand it and I can say things about him, but I won't bother. There was a compliment of sorts in the cables. The ambassador marveled at the US president's ability to survive scandal, saying he could emerge from the flames battered but intact like Schwarzenegger in the final scenes of The Terminator. Do not write him off. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Derek had a particularly dim view of Trump's Iran policy, calling it incoherent and chaotic. Washington's pressure campaign is facing some fresh pu pushback from Tehran. First, it began to stockpile uranium, and today it announced increased enrichment in violation of the 2015 nuclear accord. So here's what happened, what it means from Arthi Paul. The message in Iran is clear. They aren't looking to play games. They say by morning, uranium enrichment will have surpassed 3.67 percent, the limit imposed on Iran under the accord. The Trump administration withdrew a year ago and has since imposed punishing sanctions, blocking the country's oil sales abroad. Iran is also frustrated with the remaining signatories of the accord saying they have failed to protect Iran's economy from the American measures. That frustration has turned to anger. We've had about two months now of a number of activities that the Iranians and the Americans have been at each other uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, tankers have been hit, likely by the Iranians. Uh, a, a drone was shot down, an American drone. Um, and all of that, I think, is meant to put pressure on the Americans uh, and the European allies. But the pressure today is so far symbolic. The increased enrichment nowhere near the 90 percent needed to make a nuclear warhead. It's a relatively modest step and should be seen for what it is. It's not a non-proliferation or nuclear crisis. It's really a, an effort at diplomatic brinks brinksmanship. Iran better be careful. A warning from the U.S. president today amid fears the tough stance from the U.S. could lead to a military conflict. They better be careful. There is just so much friction and tension between Iran and the U.S. and their respective allies in the region. Um, and there's no channel of communication and no mechanism for de-escalation, no off-ramps really, uh, that uh, even a conflict can happen inadvertently. European nations are trying to mediate. The French president spoke to Iran's president, trying to reopen negotiations. Trump said today that Iran will never have nuclear weapons. But Washington's next move at this point is not clear. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. To Hong Kong now, where the streets were once again filled with protesters, more than 200,000 at least, according to organizers. The message, by now very familiar, but as Sasha Petrosik tells us, there was a new target audience today. 
Hong Kong's grievances echoed through the territory's tourist district today, a stream of young and old, a sign that this movement isn't backing down, even if friction with police has become routine along the way. There have been some concessions from the Hong Kong government, but no guarantees that democratic rights are safe from Beijing. Still, protesters say they're determined. At least I have to do the thing I need to do, and this is my responsibility to protect it. Yeah. As a Hong Konger? As a Hong Konger. These protests have been going on for a month now, on a regular basis, overflowing the streets. They have been done out of exhilaration and frustration, but for all of this excitement, they have left this city very much divided. Hong Kong's pro-China voices held their own demonstration last week, and Beijing supporters here insist all those who fear China have just been brainwashed by the West. What I mean by brainwash is that negative news were injected into young people, in the, into the entire population, by a very popular newspaper every day. And people were just online reading all the negative news without anything positive to balance it out. Things have become more confrontational as some protesters lashed out at the Hong Kong government vandalizing the legislature a week ago. Many peaceful protesters here today don't support that, but they say it's a reaction to hostility from the police. And tonight, the march did end like this. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Hong Kong. Now to some other stories we're watching this Sunday night on The National, starting with a power shift in Greece. So discussions with our European creditors uh, will, uh, will begin immediately, but uh, we've made our plan very, very clear. There are no real surprises here. Opposition leader Kyriakos Mitsotakis and his party toppled the government today in a national election. After populist leaders, this seems a return to the middle ground in Mitsotakis' centre-right party. Florida billionaire Jeffrey Epstein is expected in court tomorrow on sex trafficking charges involving underage girls. He once had friends in high places, including Donald Trump, Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew, but he's been a registered sex offender since pleading guilty to an underage prostitution charge in 2007. Uh, I am Cameron Boyce. Actor Cameron Boyce has died. He played Adam Sandler's son in the film series Grown-ups. He also appeared on the Disney Channel in Jesse and Descendants. Boyce's family says he had a seizure caused by an ongoing health condition and he was just 20. Tonight, fire is tearing through parts of northwestern Ontario, sending residents fleeing for safety. There are more than a dozen forest fires burning there tonight, but most worrying is the one that's been dubbed Red Lake 23. It's more than 71,000 hectares big. That's bigger than the city of Edmonton, and it's burning out of control, heading for the remote Kiwi Wind First Nation. As Natalie Nanowski shows us, it's all but empty of people now, except for a few. This one here is really gone. All Dion Kakigamic has been able to do for the past few days is watch as the fire creeps closer to his community. It's smoky. You know, it's, can't go near the, the sand pit anymore unless you're wearing a mask because you know, it's so thick. And it's, you know, that's, that's all you smell is the smoke now. He's one of just eight people still in Kiwe Wind First Nation. Nearly 500 were evacuated over the last few days. But Kaki Gamak works at the water treatment facility and has to keep it running so fire crews can do their job. We have a couple of water bombers that, that are going to be coming in and just you know dumping their load and then uh, they're, they'll be heading back out again because the, the, the lakes around here are too narrow and uh, too shallow for the water bombers to continuously fight it. Just two years ago, another fire swept through the area, destroying hectares of land. Ontario, like the other provinces and territories in Canada, is built to burn. The natural environments have evolved not just to adapt to fire, but to depend on it. 
A natural occurrence, yes, but for Kaki Gamak, a scary one. I didn't think I would have to uh, go through this again, you know, especially so soon. Crews from Alberta, Quebec, and even Minnesota have been sent in to help fight the fires in the province. We've been using structural protection sprinkler systems to help uh, protect uh, structures in the area and using aerial ignition to try to drive the fire to natural boundaries so it won't be able to spread. Kaki Gamak is also praying for rain, and he might just get some as early as tomorrow. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. So despite that one and other threatening fires we've seen this year, like the one near high-level Alberta, the number of wildfires in Canada so far this season is actually lower than usual. Typically, we would have seen about 3,000, 3,500 fires, and we have about 1,000 fewer fires right now that have burnt from the start of the season until now. So there are two caveats to that. We have seen bigger fires this year, specifically in Alberta and Ontario, and there is typically a peak in July and August, so it could all still change. Ahead tonight, an American city declares war on the Canada goose. First, though, going green at sea and the Canadian company leading the way. Plus. I know that I caught her at her finest moment, vocally. I caught her when she was peaking. And I will love he is the man behind some of music's biggest hits, the Sunday interview with David Foster. But first. In case you missed it, well, this one's actually pretty hard to miss. That is an artist tribute to former fashion model slash current U.S. First Lady Melania Trump. What, don't see the likeness? What about now? Now? Is this helpful? Try unfocusing your gaze. If nothing else, the location of this new life-size statue should be a tip-off. Carved from a tree rooted in a field just outside her hometown in Slovenia. It was commissioned by an American artist, but created by a local sculptor. His tool, a chainsaw. Not the most delicate choice. She does not look as beautiful as she normally is, says this man. And from this woman, you know what makes her resemble Melania? Look at how high she climbed to the top, just like real Melania, who rose to the top of America. The man who commissioned it wanted to make a point about America's anti-immigration narrative, while its first lady is herself an immigrant. He thinks the result is, quote, absolutely beautiful. It now joins all the other ways people in that area have marked their famous link to Washington, like the White House slippers and first lady salami and wine sold for the inauguration, proof that tribute, beauty, and resemblance are all in the eye of the beholder. When you saw Johnny, that was Johnny. There wasn't a smoke and mirrors. It's hard-headed and soft-hearted. Johnny Cash, American Rebel. Tuesday at 9 on Documentary Channel. Think of greener transportation and you probably think of electric cars and buses. But there is another major transport polluter that's slowly going green. The ships that haul goods to and from Canada. Worldwide, shipping spews out about 940 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, about 2.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. As part of our ongoing climate series in our backyard, Greg Rasmussen takes a look at one solution and the Canadians leading the way. On the surface, it's like many of the vessels working the BC coast, moving freight, delivering Canadian cargo. Yeah, very modern. 
but below decks, it's not your normal oil burning engine. This is the battery room. Wow, okay, that's a lot of batteries. Yeah, a lot of batteries. The Reliant is a hybrid, partly powered by electricity, much like a Toyota Prius. As with many different modes of transportation now, we're seeing electrification. Um, so in this case, we have diesel engines combined with batteries, uh, and it's definitely the way of the future. The battery system is Canadian, in use now on 200 vessels around the world. Business has spiked recently, driven by the need to reduce emissions. When you're building a new vessel, you want it to last for, say, 30 years. You don't want to adopt a technology that's kind of on the margin in terms of obsolescence. You want to build that to sort of be future-proof. A future where the shipping industry is being forced to cut back on this, smokestack emissions. Worldwide, the industry pumps out 940 million tons of CO2, nearly 3% of the global total. Scandinavia is leading the world with electric ships. These ferries are completely battery powered, recharged between sailings. Yeah, we're in the wheelhouse of the C-SPAN Reliant. After three years of daily use hauling freight along BC's coast, C-SPAN's Harley Penner is a big believer in the hybrid technology and its ability to cut CO2. What we're able to do is, in certain instances, reduce the amount of engines that we have running. And when you're reducing the amount of engines that you have running, you're reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Driving it all, new international regulations forcing the shipping industry to reduce emissions. At the same time, pressure is building from customers, such as Mountain Equipment Co-op, which closely tracks its environmental footprint. You're hearing more and more companies build it into their DNA in terms of how they do business, and that's really cool to see. It's not just NBC anymore really trying to do this. There's a lot of partners out there also. A new way to provide emission-free transport from... In the global race to cut emissions, all kinds of options are on the table, even giant kites to harvest wind power at sea. But in practical terms, hybrids like these BC boats, and in the future, pure electrics, are likely to play a larger role in keeping the propellers turning. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Delta, BC. Up next on The National, David Foster sits down with Andrew to talk about giving back and producing some of the world's biggest music stars. It made Neil Young sing it 13, at least 13 times. One line, I mean, he must have wanted to kill me. Come on, Neil, give it to me, baby. Oh, yeah. award-winning producer and music icon David Foster will wrap up his Canadian tour. His first one ever after an incredible career that has spanned decades. He has had a hand in so many major music moments and so many big hits, but there's another side to him too, one focused on charity. Tonight we revisit Andrew's conversation with David Foster about it all. David Foster is a master of his trade. Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, just three of the many superstars he's produced. So darling, sing, the last for me. At the age of four, his mother discovered he had perfect pitch. At 16, he found himself backing rock and roll legend Chuck Berry. All right, David, David Foster! Foster has won Junos. Yeah, thank you. Grammys. I, I just can't even believe that I'm up here at this point in my career. That was unbelievable. And with a reputation as a proven hit maker, he's won the respect of music royalty. He's got one of the best ears in music. This is my friend. I'm here for my friend. Thank you. But for more than 30 years, charity has also been on his mind. In 1986, he created the David Foster Foundation to help the families of kids needing organ transplants. Thank you, Ken. In March, in recognition of his charitable work, he was presented with the Juno's Humanitarian Award. Hey, Andrew. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Thanks for making the time. Pleasure. I met up with David Foster recently at the Glenn Gould Theater right here in Toronto. We're, so we're not actually allowed to play this piano, otherwise I'd have you... You, you know, realize that adjust. Glenn Gould would want people to play his piano. You realize that, right? I think we need to talk to the people in charge here. <laughs> 
So, so I, the first thing I should say is congratulations. The Humanitarian Award yeah. at the Junos. It, it's a different award than perhaps you're used to getting, but how does it feel? Well, it, it, it feels exactly like that, like very different. And it feels really good because we've worked really hard with my foundation over the last 33 years to grow it into something spectacular. And so now we're coast to coast to coast. And if you are a family that has a child that needs an organ transplant, um, we are going to help you with all your non-medical costs. And it's been life-saving for over a thousand families now. You really, to your credit, you really leveraged your connections to, to raise a heck of a lot of money. And, and I saw footage of a, a celebrity softball tournament, mm -hmm. you know. From That's how we started, yeah. It's a really good cause and nobody's doing anything like it. And David Foss is an old, old friend of mine. Thank you. He called me like two in the morning. He said, you're either going to be there or you know, I'll never talk to you again. And uh, I mean, not just for those reasons, but I promised them I would, so I'm here. Was it hard to get other celebrities, other, other musicians, other personalities on board? I have begged my whole life people to come and do my charity. And it's not that they don't want to, but you know, famous people get asked every day to do charities. And you can't spend your life doing charities, otherwise you won't make a living doing, it, what, you, doing what you do. So the list is endless from Bocelli to Celine to Buble to Anne Murray to Reba McIntyre. It's an endless list of people that I have bothered to the point where they probably won't even take my call anymore. But I have no shame when it comes to my foundation. We raise tonight 6.5 million. 3.2 million we raised tonight. 10.2 million dollars. So to come full circle to get this humanitarian award at the Junos, at the bequest of Michael Bublé, by the way, it was he that sort of got the Junos thinking about it. Speaking of bringing big names under the tent, so, so a year before the start of the foundation, 1985, tears are not enough. You know, raising are money. Are you just coincidentally asking me this? Because we were talking about that in the car. Oh, really? And we, I actually pulled it up, the clip of some of it, and I hadn't seen it in 20 years. And it was amazing to see a young Joni Mitchell and a young Neil yeah. Young. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Roll playback. What did you think when you saw that? Well, what I thought specifically was that I was an incredible taskmaster and control freak, <laughs> is what I got out of watching myself on tape. Together you and I! Longer. Together you and I! Again. Okay, well, well, this is exactly what I want to ask you about, because I was struck by how you could sit there and you could listen to a great performer really, really belt out the take of their life. And then you hit the button to talk to them, you say, yeah, that wasn't it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's do one more. I know. And I noticed today, just in the car watching, I said, okay, this is take number 13. To the, I made Neil Young sing it 13, at least 13 times, one line. I mean, he must have wanted to kill me. Somehow our innocence is lost. A little flat on innocence, but other than that, it was great. We'll go again, huh? Mm -hmm. One more time. Somehow our... That's my sound, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's my sound. Like, in other words, I'm done with you. <laughs> but, but, I mean, the, the, it, it does speak to a talent and a responsibility of yours, right? When it comes to, A, coaxing out the very best performance you can get out of a musician, but then also managing what I suspect, maybe wrongly, are pretty big egos. Yeah, I mean, including my own, right? <laughs> including my own ego. So it's, uh, you know, my job, like your job today is to try and get the best out of me, which means you will do anything because you're good at your job. You will do anything to try and get the best out of me. My job is to get the best out of the singer. I will do whatever it takes to get the best out of the singer. But it doesn't involve only getting one take from them. That's not enough for me to work with. I have to have eight takes, 10 takes, so that I can get the very best out of them and make a vocal that sounds like it was done in one take, but it actually wasn't. But how do you do that without ticking them off? Well, they hear the end result and they like it. The line that'll always stick with me is, perfect, but one more. <laughs> I know, isn't that stupid? <laughs> that was perfect, can I just have one more? I mean, that's so insane. But I have this mantra of that good is the enemy of great. 
And I can literally be good in my sleep. I can make a record in my sleep and it would be good, but it won't be great. I try to be great. Whitney Houston, what was it like working with her? She was a laser beam. I like to say that when I did the Bodyguard, uh, or her songs on the Bodyguard, it probably wasn't her greatest album ever. I mean, the stuff that came before that was amazing. But I know that I caught her at her finest moment, vocally. I caught her when she was peaking. And I, most days, got her at the end of it after she had already been filming for 10 days. And then she'd come to the studio late at night. And it was really tough on her. It was really hard on her. But she would just walk into the studio, rip her coat off, step up to the mic, and go like a racehorse. It was incredible. We had a great time together. Celine Dion, um, when, when she came onto your radar and, and you first heard her sing, I mean, you were instrumental in bringing her to, to English audiences. Yeah, I can't take any credit for discovering her because she was already a big star in Quebec, so. I initiated her coming to Los Angeles. I ended up doing her first album, working on her first album. I'm loving every moment with you. You are truly remarkable. Thank you. Let me listen to it back. I said, three things are going to happen to you, at least. One, you're going to be known by your first name only. They won't even have to say your last name. Two, Barbara Streisand is going to know who you are because she was, Barbara was her idol. Mm -hmm. And three, Barbara Streisand is going to sing with you. And I fortunately was able to help make all three of those things happen. Tell him, tell him that the sun when you think of her iconic songs, what are the ones or the one that, that stands out to you? I don't know if that's a setup question or not. It is a little bit. <laughs> is it? It's a little bit. Yeah. Tell me your favorite. Okay, I'll tell. Well, so my heart will go on. Okay, this interview's over. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't, please stay. But I mean, it, it is yeah, one of the songs story, that, yeah. that most people identify yeah, with her, right? From Titanic. I know. So her and I have had so many hits together from um, Because You Love Me, The Power of Love, All By Myself. That song, My Heart Will Go On, I just wasn't a fan of the song. And what I, did you like about it? I just didn't like it. Um, I thought it was a beautiful movie melody, but the song, it sh I thought it was a melody that should never have lyrics to and never be sung. Did you think it was going to be the hit that it ended up No. I, I was asked to produce it. I said, I don't want to produce this song. I don't like it. Huh. Hey, when you're wrong, you got to be wrong big, right? And then the Canadian tour. Yeah, let's talk about the tour. Yeah. So, back to me. <laughs> and, oh, and after the love is done. I'm excited about it, you know, because it's a way to, um, I'd show you if I was allowed to play that piano, <laughs> yeah. but it's a way of, after so many years of making music, Andrew, and not really having that feel with the audience. So all the artists that I work with get to have that feeling after they leave me of performing those songs that we've worked on together and getting feedback from the audience. So in the last decade or so, um, I've started touring and it's felt good. And um, we're gonna do this in Canada. I think it's a perfect place to do this tour. I mean, I, I'm Canadian. I'm a huge flag waver. I mean, I love telling people I'm from Canada. I'm so proud to be from Canada. It's gonna be fun. Uh, it's been wonderful, David, to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, for Andrew. Time. Nice job, man. And congrats. And man. no notes. That's impressive. <laughs> It is. When we come back, artificial intelligence could play a big role in your next job interview. Is that necessarily a good thing? But first, there is a hole tonight in the hearts of people at CBC and those who advocate for Canadians living with disabilities. This weekend, 46-year-old Ng Wong Ward died of colon cancer. For 23 years, she was a producer at CBC before taking an advocacy role. She was also a mom and a wife, but to strictly define her was to confine her, and that she resisted. Value to me means having a good life, an interesting life, a life that is full of diverse possibilities, and being disabled doesn't prevent you from being that. In her last days, she was open about dying and having that hard conversation with her little one. I'm glad that we had it uh, because she's now actually 
more comfortable in some ways with knowing what the future looks like. Now she at least knows that things are going to be difficult, but we have some time to be together and to create memories. All weekend, the words that have been flowing for Ing Wong Ward are consistent. Fierce, fearless, strong, tireless, and we'll miss you. I'm Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, Vice reporter Ben McCoo on his long-failed fight to keep an ISIS source's communications away from the RCMP. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. According to StatsCan, the Canadian economy stalled last month, shedding about 2,000 jobs. That is a rare disappointment for 2019, which has been stellar for job creation. And economists stress these numbers are volatile. It is the trend that matters. But this is a reminder that at any given moment, job seekers can find it tough out there and every little edge counts. For women and minorities, hiring bias can affect your chances. That's a problem tech companies are looking to solve. Artificial intelligence could save companies time, money, and be more fair. But as Matthew Braga discovered, trusting HR to AI comes with its own problems. Here's a second look at what he found. So this one is from Luis Guillermo Trejo Letachapaya. Getting a job is hard. Even getting an interview can seem impossible. In terms of hiring, I always go by Guillermo Trejo. It's a multifaceted challenge, but there's one in particular we wanted to hear about. So my producer made a call out. Hi, I'm Anand Ram. Well, actually, my name is Chandrasekhar Ramakrishnan. You can tell why I never put that on a resume. We're working on a story about hiring at The National, and we want to know if you've got a story like mine. So we heard from a few Canadians. Uh, some change their name on resumes, some don't. Some don't change it on paper, but when they get to the office, they do it just so they have an easier time communicating. So this message is from Moisha Callow. Quote, I found that if I use my name on a resume, I'm much less likely to get a call for an interview than if I use an English name. Yeah, this one's from uh, Anjana Kipfer. Uh, that's her husband's last name. Back in the day, I sent tons of resumes as Ghosh Dastidar, and most of the time, crickets. Sent same resume as Kipfer, got a call on the first one. Coincidence? Maybe. Sure, but there is Canadian research that suggests that maybe it's not a coincidence and that names do matter. Yeah, I mean, take a look at you and me. We went to the same school, have the same degree, but that Canadian research suggests that a Matthew is 39% more likely to get a call back than a Chandrasekhar. And just that one bias, names on a resume, was why a Toronto software company called Nakri was founded. I was extremely broken. I would apply to hundreds of positions and I just like wouldn't hear back. And I said, hey, John Zip, maybe you might want to try changing your name on your resume to Jason. I changed up my name to Jason for a couple of the resumes to Jay, Jamal, just try to like test it out. And within four weeks, I got a job. But having to change his name in the first place, well, that didn't sit well with Ansari. He co-founded Nakri with a goal to reduce human bias in the hiring process so that no one else would be overlooked for something as irrelevant as a name. And not just a name, but race, gender, ethnicity, and sexuality too. I'm interested in consulting because of... When you apply for a job with a company that uses Nakri software, you're asked to record yourself answering a few short questions. That's where artificial intelligence comes in. We're essentially assessing verbal and nonverbal communication skills. We're taking a look at emotion, tonality, and speech, and exactly that relevance of that response as well. Nakri uses facial recognition as well as speech and language analysis. The algorithms look at several thousand data points to evaluate traits such as empathy, confidence, and a willingness to collaborate, what psychologists say can be predictors of a person's success. The algorithms score each candidate's performance, and employers get a shortlist of the most highly ranked. No names, no faces. Nakri says employees see 17% more candidates of color and 6% more women on average when compared to their previous hiring practice. It's an improvement, but some are skeptical that we can use AI reliably in this way. It seems very pernicious to me, I think, to expect the signals we affect with our face uh, being somehow a reliable indicator of some fundamental human truth about our 
competencies and capabilities. This is Solon Barakas. He studies fairness and accountability in AI-assisted decision-making, and for good reason. What is commonly believed is that by just automating some process, somehow you've now just eliminated the source of, of possible bias. But machine learning requires that you provide it with historical examples. The examples are going to probably feed forward many of the same kinds of bias, biases that this system is ostensibly supposed to eliminate. We put that concern to Nokri. So what have you guys done to ensure that uh, your own algorithms aren't also introducing their own uh, bias as well in sort of that process? We made sure that A, we have a diverse team at Nokri, and secondly, is a diverse data set of race, gender, ethnicity, accents. And if the algorithm begins analyzing something that seems a little bit foreign or unfamiliar to it, it will red flag those videos so that a person can take a look at it. Nokri isn't the only company using AI in the hiring process, but even if the technology works as promised, it's only part of the puzzle. As for what happens after someone's been hired. Are we ready to receive them? Are we ready to actually encourage them to succeed in the way that other people get to succeed. As an advocate for women in the science and tech sectors, Sadia Muzaffar worries that companies will try to use this software without having considered biases in their company's culture overall. Women, particularly, uh, may be brought in as a result of this because somebody somewhere said, we need to diversify our candidate pool. But have you done the work of, you know, revising pay equity in the workplace where they're coming in? Have you done the work of making sure that if there are issues of uh, abuse of power or sexual harassment, that there are policies in place where these women can go? All of these things are people things. That software is not going to help with that. To their credit, Nokri's co-founders say they understand and that they're only interested in working with clients who get it too. There's no silver bullet. You know, you can't just onboard a whole bunch of uh, technological solutions and say you've done your work. Even as a company, we have the long term in mind, right? If a customer comes to us and they just want these sound bites and they want to improve their metrics, those candidates that they end up hiring are going to eventually leave that organization anyways because they weren't in an inclusive environment that let them thrive. Matthew Braga, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, a moment of pure, unadulterated celebration is our moment of the day. USA! 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 There's something Canada needs to know. In the city of Denver, Colorado, your goose is cooked. They had gotten to the point where the parks were just being are, are almost unenjoyable for a lot of people. So that is why we moved forward with this, this plan. Some see the plan as cold-blooded, with this public park overrun by thousands of snowbirds, both seasonal visitors and a growing number of settlers. The city has been rounding up the Canada geese so they can be euthanized, butchered, and offered as food to homeless shelters. They are taking them to a processor where they're processed and they are donating them to needy families. Some people are calling it overkill. I think supporting underprivileged people is noble. Killing wild geese to feed them sounds ridiculous. Yesterday, about 100 protesters appeared to show their opposition to the cull, with signs suggesting it's better to scoop up droppings than take a bite out of nature. But this is a park. People want to be in nature and play. Why kill them? To be fair, Denver has been hosting this Canadian invasion for some time and has tried non-lethal solutions, like dogs that are trained to scare the geese but not attack. The Border Collie is one of the few dogs that will actually drop their shoulders like an Arctic fox, their number one predator up in Canada, and they will not touch them under any circumstance. Someone even built a motorized goosenator to scare away the interlopers, but they don't scare so easy. This week, the protest group will go before City Council to speak up for Canada's unwanted snowbirds. When it comes to soccer, the U.S. women's team dominates the field and proved that again today. So, time to celebrate. And they are sharing their victory with the world. Their pure joy in their fourth big win is our moment. I mean, we put on, as all players, I'm saying, every player at this World Cup, put on the most incredible show that you could ever ask for. I think that there's no team that is more battle-tested in knockout stages. USA! 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 
to move on to the next stage, and that's kind of what this team is all about. And we The wins and the championships speak for themselves. Um, you know, we have a, a super talented group of players and a very talented staff. Um, and I think just top to bottom, um, I mean, I feel like I'm biased, but I feel like top to bottom, especially with the support staff that we have, the technical staff, uh, we're world class. So it's credit to her, for sure. So not clear if they're going to the White House, but they are getting an old school ticker tape parade in New York on Wednesday. That is the National for July 7th. Good night.